Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Transpicuous Views. We had a bit of a fumble start there for a second. It's okay. You know, technical glitches is just the way we roll. Um, we're going to be doing a special discussion tonight. Unfortunately, some of our discussers are a little late to the table. That's okay, because I have Emily with me. So Emily and I are just going to wing it until Randy and Jeff show up. Hi, Emily. How are you? Hi, Danny. Hey. How are you? Nice to see you again. How are you doing? Oh, Peach Keen. Peach Keen. Thanks, thanks for having me. I see we have a lot of like off-planet listeners in the room here, too. So hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. I don't know how I've ended up talking about Bitcoin. <laughs> this is like the last thing I ever thought I'd be on the air talking about. But here we are. And let me just send... It's an interesting subject, though. Like For sure. So many depths to this. I mean, it just seems like you just start to crack a surface and you start to think, okay, I, I got this. I've got a handle on this. And then all of a sudden, some, another, you break through to another layer and you go, oh, wait a second. Oh, wait a second. What, what, what the fuck is this shit? And then you kind of start cracking through that. And oh, there's another level. So there's, this is, as far as I'm concerned right now, this is one of the number one conversations to be discussing because there's so many levels to this. Yeah. And we are, we are seeing it explode and we're about to see it explode globally. Mm -hmm. So I kind of feel like those of us who are kind of like on the leading edge of this, we really need to kind of break this down as best we can before the tidal wave hits everyone else. So, Ah, oh, you guys, you and Randy did a phenomenal show this week. Thank you. I have been telling everyone, and I don't mean just like our crowds. I'm talking even people that I know like in real life who are, who are just starting to discover Bitcoin and all the rest of it. I'm like, stop what you're doing. You need to go listen to this show because Cliff High really laid it out. Like nice clean he there was shit that he said that made me go oh fuck i never understood that and now i fucking understand it so hats off to danny katz she asked him she dug hard and she asked really tough questions and she was like a pit bull because she just kept going after like when she when he didn't answer it the way she wanted she'd keep going back and saying okay no 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 what i want to know is you know what is the value which was such yeah. Um, you know, yeah, Danny Katz, and I thank you for hatsing off to her. She's received like a lot of like not constructive criticism and comment no, sections, awesome. but also, but also some very good and interesting responses. And one of the reasons I love Danny is because she is extremely persistent. She is not afraid. She's like, she, like, you know, like for a lot of people might've been embarrassed to get up there and look silly asking some of those questions or whatever. She is not afraid. She does not care. She's extremely intelligent. She's an independent. She's been a journalist for a very long time. She is also a linguist, although a different kind of linguist than clips. So she understands language in a way. She's, she's what she calls a quantum language hacker. She basically, you know, trying to use uh, language to change, to reframe how we see ourselves and move ourselves forward as a people and whatever. But she's, um, you know, she, the conversation will continue with her as well. And um, she and I are going to record a follow-up video. You know, we didn't, we wanted to let Cliff really talk and really explain it and not be too, she was persistent in her questions, but we weren't trying to be too, you know, aggressively, um, uh, anti-bitcoin like during 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 the show or anything like that because we wanted to really hear what he had to say let it sit in let it marinate and then you know 
now with a couple of days under our belt and listening to some more people, listening to the conversation about it, we, you know, we're ready to have some response to it because um, she and I are still not convinced. And I, I, I can, you know, maybe Randy as well. Um, and it's not, you know, like I, the one thing that really got cleared up for us, and I don't want to get too much into some of this stuff because she and I are going to talk about some of it. But the one thing that did get cleared up for us is that Cliff actually really does understand Bitcoin. Like yeah. it had gotten to the point where it seemed like maybe nobody really understands it. And we're just, uh, you know, but Cliff really does understand it. And I can understand why he thinks it's a good thing. I think some of the, um, maybe the disagreement or the not being convinced comes at that level of like, well, Maybe, you know, I can understand people's perspective that it's a good thing because it's, you know, better than the system we have now. But to me, in a lot of ways, that is a false choice. That is like saying um, voting for the less of two evils or, um, you know, we have to have government because otherwise there would be chaos or whatever. So for me, I think it's a false choice. And I think that there are, you know, like the idea that it's either cryptocurrencies or Mad Max is not right. And even if even if let's just say for the sake of discussion that that was right, that that is that those are the only two options, that that's the Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And those are the only two options or whatever. Like for some of us, you know, in, in my head, and I don't want this, but in my head, Mad Max might be prefer preferable to an AI run future. You know what I mean? And I don't. And while what Cliff says about AI not being sentient, you know, I understand his point with that, but my, my response to that would basically be, no, but if the people programming the AI are, not, are evil fucks, AI is a great um, tool for uh, non-human intelligence, non-human entities, or evil human entities to use to sort of, you know, funnel their, their control, you know, through, through, like through this. And, um, you know, so I, to me, what, what is so fascinating about this conversation and then the many levels that you spoke about is really like, there's two separate issues here. There's like a monetary issue. There's like a value issue, monetary value issue, monetary usefulness issue. And then there's also the issue of, is this some sort of further, and Randy brought this up the other day, and I think it's a great way to put it, further energetic buy-in to, a, you know, a future that will be controlled by blockchain and AI. And is this, you know, there was supposed to have been a fork in Bitcoin last week with the whole thing with Coinbase and all that kind of stuff that didn't really seem to happen. I think that the true fork is this, is, is this, is that some of us, and I mentioned this when I posted our show, I think that there are some people who are um, comfortable and even, I like the idea of a future based on cryptocurrencies and technology. And then there's other people who would prefer to have a more organic, life-affirming, um, human-based sort of future that uses technology where and when and how it benefits us, but is not so reliant or enamored by it, reliant on it or enamored of it. You know what I mean? So I think that's kind of a fork that's happening. And it doesn't have to be that one side is right and one side is wrong or one side is good and one side is bad. And there's many little lanes and alleys between the two main forks. And I think the communication between the different camps is important. And, you know, if Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies really is a good thing, that will be proven over time. We don't have to make that, like, we don't all have to buy into this right now. You know what I mean? I think that these conversations are important to be having. And to me, it's, you know, it's always been kind of an intuitive no. I've done more looking into it now than I had done, like, this has been on my radar for a long time, and I just not into it. And, you know, all the fever pitch lately has made me do some more research. Um, and consider a lot of things but ultimately something inside of me holds me back and is like yeah, i don't really want to do this yeah you know what I mean? so i have to listen to that hi randy hi randy my darling you're muted yeah i'm muted um hi hey guys we got i got really bad bandwidth here right now so i don't know if that's on everybody's side or not i'm my internet is not very speedific itself so yeah maybe emily's a, like the, emily and, and john carl will be like the, the the grounding points to hold our, our our the show together to keep that band <laughs> on um so listen backtracking i want to go back to the interview because here's the thing emily i know that you're not a bitcoin fan i know that randy's not sold on the idea what I loved about the interview you guys did this week with Cliff High and Danny Katz is there was a great fact finding. Mm -hmm. A lot of information was put on the table. And like I said, 
I think Danny is probably the first one to have ever actually kind of pushed Cliff to really answer the questions and bring it to the simplest, most clear and concise level. And that's everyone who's watched it has, said, has come away from it the same way and gone, oh my God, now I understand. Because he actually, for the first time ever, anyone I've seen, yeah, really clearly explained a lot of the part, background of Bitcoin. But the show was awesome because you guys, there was a neutrality throughout the whole show. That we'll bring the questions to the table. Let's discuss it, regardless of what our personal gut feeling is on it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's a lot bigger layers to this. And you know, it, to me, it's unfortunate that it's taken this long for those questions to be asked and for, for him to, and not, this isn't about pushing Cliff or not pushing Cliff. We all love and adore Cliff for yeah. all of the reasons that everyone knows why. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean we have to agree with him about everything or whatever, but it's, it shouldn't have taken this long for this to happen. And this goes to, in my opinion, the fact that journalism is dead. And Danny is a true investigative journalist and she, that's the way you have to attack it. You know what I mean? You have to have people who are just going at it and really, you know, with some of this stuff, people don't like it, it's complex. And people are afraid to ask questions because they don't want to seem dumb or they don't want to see like they're not, not up to date on it. But to be quite honest, Cliff is the only person I've heard explain it in a way where I actually believe he understands it. Yep. I hear other people, you know, like parroting a lot of the things that he says. Like this, I had, there's some like strange like drone bot person came into my work one day and like it was weird. It was like he was on a drone mission there to try and convince me about something about Bitcoin. And he was talking to me and he had like this glazed over look in his eyes and he had no idea what he was saying. Like he did not understand the words that were coming out of his mouth. Yeah. And they used like, cloned words, so to speak. Totally. It was like a programmed response. And it, like, he was telling me how much money he made, but he couldn't, he, when I asked him why this whole, you know, when I, I asked him, why is this a good thing? Why, when I asked him any of the challenging questions that were even like sli only slightly as challenging as the things that Danny was asking Cliff, he just looked at me like I, like, like I was like, I had you know, suggested he stop showering or something. Like, you know what I mean? Like what? You know, like, really, and I don't think he blinked the whole time he was talking to me. I'm like, literally, like, it feels almost like the blockchain just programmed him to come into my restaurant and try and convince me of something that it knows I'm not buying into. You know what I mean? I ain't going to say you're wrong. I ain't going to say you're wrong because I've had enough experiences with myself on this kind of shit that you go, where's that camera? Where's the candid camera? Because I swear someone's filming this shit. Yeah. Um, the, okay, so you brought up the AI. Because that's an aspect of this. Regardless of whether Quinn Michaels is right or wrong, regardless of the he, AI built the blockchain, it built block Bitcoin, or it didn't, regardless. The AI is one of the big questions. Mm -hmm. Now, the first thing I would like to do is I'd like to make, just sit here for this conversation, I'd like to set up, because words fuck us over every time, and misinter you know, everyone has their own definitions of words, well, I think Jeff is here, just by the way. I just saw him pop in on the conversation. Did Jeff just pop in? Get, There's Jeff. Get, yeah, he didn't get your message earlier, Danny. I didn't. So, yeah. It's so okay. Sorry. Bye. We Hi, had, Jeff. I'm going to take all the blame on this, guys. This is all my fault. This whole, because of daylight savings time, I thought I was still five hours ahead of Eastern. So I gave everyone a one hour off time and like all the way through. And it wasn't until literally Emily called me on it and went, uh, wait. Wait. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit balls. <laughs> okay. So it's all my fault. I screwed up all the time. Hi, Jeff. How are you doing? Hi, Jeff. Hi, Hi Jeff. Hi, Randy. It's, Hi, Em. Hi, it's, Jeff. It's, isn't that, Jeff, it's nice to finally meet you. You and I have been sort of communicating in the background for a long time. And yes. um, I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate the interaction with you and some of the tips you've given me in the past. And so it's nice to finally talk to you. Yes, pleasure. Pleasure's mine. So... So we've just been talking, we've been talking about um, the fantastic interview uh, with Randy and Emily and Danny Katz and Cliff High this week, which was blown out of the water phenomenal. Um, the thing about the AI, so I want to get back to this and say, I would like to put some definitions in here because I would like to, there is artificial intelligence. And by artificial intelligence, my interpretation is a programmed <coughs> intelligence that is born of a computer system that is programmed by a person. It, it runs on its programs and it may have, it may pass the Turing test, but it's not conscious. 
it doesn't have a, an aspect of consciousness to it. That's what I call artificial intelligence. On the flip side of that, the other subject that I've been talking about for a couple of years is a created consciousness. Something that is born of perhaps the internet, born of a computer system, but is actually conscious, self-aware, and not controlled, not programmed. It is something that is born of its own self-awareness. So I just want to put that out there as, as, as like two separate things so we can kind of keep some of this conversation on track. So the AI question, like I said, whether Quinn Michaels is right or wrong, it did yeah. Bitcoin, it didn't. I think, I, th I think the other, those were great separations. And I think the other things we have, to, this is an, another thing I got, like was a huge walk away for, I walked away with this big time from the interview with Cliff is because we all are involved in a lot of different information and a lot of different levels of information. We have to be really clear to like have, make sure we understand the, the differences and the separations also between AI, nanotechnology, transhumanism, because yes. those of us in the mind control and geoengineering and all this kind of stuff conversation, we understand that those things all have a play in together. That doesn't mean that they're the same thing. They exactly. serve each other, they interact, they complement each other, but we have to be like, be, be, particularly for this Bitcoin conversation, we have to understand that like the people who are looking at this from a technical standpoint aren't going to necessarily take into consideration our concerns about the other aspects that we consider to be related to our part of artificial intelligence. No, I completely, 100% agree. And so, thank you. so unlike everybody else, Cliff High is kind of unique because he also has this metaphysical side. Of, so really? Randy, I just have to tell you this real fast. Something funny is going on with your microphone where you don't sound like your normal voice. You sound like you're like a Disney cartoon character. <laughs> it sounds really <laughs> I was just, I didn't even know it was Randy talking. At first, I, I thought it was someone cutting in. It doesn't sound like Randy. Okay, let me... Let me it sounds like you just uh, sucked a bunch, a bunch of helium. It sounds like you've sucked helium and came on as a munchkin or something. <laughs> All right. Okay, Randy's going to axe out for just a quick second and try yeah. to come back and not be on helium. When he comes <laughs> that was really weird. <laughs> this is the thing, the question of the AIs, because this is a question, we've been feeling this now, all of us, independently, for a couple of years. We've had big discussions. We've looked at so many aspects. We've looked at CERN and we've looked at quantum computers. Yeah. We've looked at DARPA. Mm -hmm. and when you talk about the transhumanist shit, you have to, to look at what's already, we know that's already available through DARPA. They've made the announcements, right? right. And that's when, when, when Cliff made his thing about he does not believe that AI exists. One of the statements he made, uh, and he said was because if any programmer was ever to come up with AI, they'd be screaming it from the mountaintops and, and waiting for their Nobel Prize. And I just- okay, but to be clear, yeah. conscious AI. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh -huh. yeah. And that's why I wanted to put, and that's where I wish, I actually kind of wish we could have Cliff High on the conversation now, because I want to put that, that's why I put the definitions in place. And that's where I think there was a crossover mix, and I think Randy was just about to talk about that, of the medical. Well, we don't have Oh, yeah, you sound normal. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Well, at least I sound normal. Okay, so... There's a lot of terms and jargon on the field that have been inflated, convoluted, and among them is AI itself, which has been defined largely by tech the technology people as a, a tagline for designs of code that operate on certain and what are called heuristic processes. In other words, they computationally do learn as they go along. They're linear processes as such, so they're not like the human thought process. Mm -hmm. The word AI is there for a reason. This is an artificial process. Process does not produce sentience, nor can it achieve consciousness within itself. But what it can do, and what we've been warned years by people inside the technology field, science fiction writers, futurists, out 
Von Toffler, um, Zbigniew Brzezinski has written on this, is that there is a tipping point for technology where it simulates an intelligence enough because of computational... In other words, one of the issues that I have with Bitcoin isn't Bitcoin itself. It is the system that is erecting around not only just the mining of Bitcoin, but the maintenance of a Bitcoin network, which is inherently heavy on energy usage and also is creating a field, an energetic field that's very real. It's using real world resources that actually are mine to produce a synthesis of something that we call money. So there's a couple things at play here. So I define them within kind of bracketing those terms. Mm. Mm. Um, Randy, you're really, I don't know for everyone else, but you're really breaking up badly. Yeah. Maybe you want to turn your camera off. It might. I may, well, no, I may act. My vo is my volume that bad? No, your no, volume's your volume okay. Fine, you're but actually you're cutting out. Like, uh, your last... Well, that's what said, was happening. You only got two-thirds of what you said. Let's carry on. Yeah, I'm sorry, Randy. We'll have to have Randy just on audio because, unfortunately, we missed a bunch of what he just said with that last bit. Um, no, this is, this is where the English language screws us up. And when we, we are not all on the same page for words mm -hmm. or um, defined terms are not defined. So AI has become a term that's, like you say, it's been thrown out in books and movies and tech there, and conspiracy there's as much, theory. There's as much confusion and misuse of the word artificial intelligence as there is of the word fascism. People who are, everyone's calling everyone a fascist and none of them are actually like calling people fascists to fit the definition of, of the word. So it's the same thing with artificial intelligence. There's a huge gap in what the word actual, words actually mean and what people understand it to mean. No, I completely agree. And that's why I said def, def, definitions need to be laid on the table so that as we bring up topics, unfortunately, we end up using keywords because that's how the audience recognizes the topic we're talking about. But if we can't define it, then we could all be talking about completely different things. Okay. Randy was mentioning, you know, AI code, the code uh, doesn't, how do, how do you get sentience or consciousness from just code? So there's that little uh, UK TV series called Humans. I think it's a couple seasons deep where they're robots, but all of a the sudden they get super code and then they become supposedly sentient or conscious. And they go through the iterations of, you know, killing a human and, and establishing morals. But, so I'm looking at that little narrative. Well, if say that does happen, that is wordcraft, spellcraft, um, invoking supposed consciousness, but it's not a spirit consciousness. It's an entity consciousness. I, I agree a hundred percent. Absolutely. Right? Yes. And, so, and they're in, then, like I said, on <laughs> we don't even know how to define consciousness. So we start back, and this is the after show on Wednesday. I did the big discussion on this topic, and then the after show ended up being discussion ended up being so good. I ended up releasing that video as well. When we can't define consciousness, because there is a defined difference, whether it's a spirit consciousness, an entity. A manufactured, a uh, even self-aware, even if a computer becomes self-aware, that does not mean that it has what would we call, I'm going to use the word spirit consciousness, for, just because it's a word that we can all kind of grasp and get at least get the intrinsic idea of what I'm trying to say. There is a difference. And that's the stumbling block when people start make, trying to define mm, these tricky words. 
Right. So what I see right now is a is there's a bit of distraction uh, creating a new uh, what's the opposite of a savior? A <laughs> antichrist. <laughs> yeah, that is distracting from yet uh, another angle of how entities are trying to co-opt the system. Um, Can you define that a little better? Like, just just to clarify. Um, you know, the whole meme of AI's smarter than us will never outthink it. Will it's going to control us? Um, it's it's to me it's a distraction from the real baddies out there that are just using that want to stay under the under the radar. So we're we're thrown. Uh, you know, the new age has a bunch of baddies or goodies, depending on your perspective. Uh, the, the, you know, blue alien chicken cult or whatever. But it's all always a distraction from the underlying... Uh, Randy, you did a really good with the five series with Ash, Dr. Ashmere or... Asher, Shamil Asher, yeah. 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 By the way, am I being heard better now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Way better. Okay. So when Quinn comes out with this narrative, yes, I got triggered for three hours and settled down and went, wait a minute. I know Quinn to be a Wikipedia research guy. <laughs> He sits there for hours, calls up Wikipedia, which is a data source that is co-opted beyond belief. It's the official reality that they want to present, and he's putting pieces together. That's not to say his data is invalid, but, but um, um, I went through my trigger phase and went, wait a minute, is this a fact based on a, a pyramid that doesn't have a solid base? And so I checked myself and went, wait a minute. Um, I got to sift through that. But then I wanted to see the bigger picture of why this distraction was even presented. And it's like we're getting close to something and we're thrown a dis yet another distraction in this, this awareness truther club we're in. Um, it... It just seems like every six months there's another distraction. Sure. Um, so I was starting to chew on that as well as um, uh, why um, why our group um, gets triggered so easily by new data sources or new narratives, if I may speak globe, you know, generally. So, so that's where I, I was I, going. Yeah. So I, I, you know, and you and I had exchanged the messages about this, the same thing, Jeff. And, um, you know, for me, um, I, like it was interesting. I'd never heard of Quinn before I saw some of those videos that came out last week. And to me, it wasn't actually triggering because it wasn't like, oh, I hadn't thought of that stuff. And this made me start thinking that stuff. I was like, oh, that's interesting. This person just was able to put, put and condense into words all of the thoughts and feelings and concerns that I've had about it. So to me, it wasn't actually triggering. And to be, like, to be honest, there's a lot of um, a person coming from my background, there's a lot of issues when I look at someone like Quinn, right? Like I can see that, like what he would possibly be used for, like how, you know, also I, all kinds of things. So I, I agree with you, but I, 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 that, you know, about the distraction stuff, about why this is presented now, but I think it is, um, I think he raises some valid points and concerns. I agree with you. I've looked at some of his other videos, like he's too much of a Wikipedia, you know, researcher and, and Wikipedia is ridiculous and all that, just all that kind of stuff. But I'm talking about 
what he's talking about speaks more to me on like an intuitive level. It didn't send me into any kind of panic about anything because nothing, he, you know what I mean? Like he didn't send me into any kind of panic. I think there's others that it did. I think there's other people who, um, you know, definitely were triggered by it and whatnot. But I think to dismiss um, what Quinn is saying as solely that, you know, you and I both know that they put things out that have some percentage of truth in it and some percentage of non-truth and they're hoping for a triggered reaction. They're hoping people get hysterical. So I think we need to like take a holistic look at what he said as well as the same the things that Cliff have said and the things that you're saying and whatever and keep them sort of all in mind as we each decide for ourselves how to progress forward through this but yes I think just having a, a flip reaction you know like to me it was just oh this is interesting he's saying you know what I what I what I've long thought but I agree with you like the fever pitch that it got to and the fact that there was then like 10 15 20 more videos made on the same topic about the same thing within 37 seconds of it when nobody had even had a chance to sort of digest it is a sign that we are, um, to a large extent, a very reactive group of people, and things are definitely put into our. I don't think we're. I'll be very honest. I don't <laughs> think we're. I don't think we're being reactive, and I also don't think this is a distraction. Now, Quinn's video doesn't change my view on anything. Yeah, me it either. It may have dropped some interesting nuggets out there, but. They're really off the table as far as I'm concerned. I've been saying this stuff forever, <laughs> literally for as yeah, long as I've done this show. Yeah, And I do think that any system that presumes that it is going to become the major arbiter of human values, which is what a currency system is, needs to be scrutinized with a very high level yep. of yeah. putting things to the test. And part of that test isn't just the mechanisms of the systems, but the psychology behind it. Yes. And, and that's the thing. So this, with the Quinn Michael stuff, it was the same with me. I wasn't triggered. I didn't have a panic moment. I just sat there and went going, okay, that's interesting. I'm going to, let me, let me take a look at some of this. I felt that he brought some stuff to the table. I felt that he also brought a lot of stuff that was fluff. That there was stuff. There was a lot of stuff that went in there that was personal opinion. That was his his perspective that he brought to the table that isn't necessarily conclusive or factual. It's what he his perspective is. But it opened up questions, and that's what I got from it. Is all of a sudden I saw a lot of people sit back and go, "Okay, hold on." Let me just dip my toe in this water for a second and test the temperature because there's something here. And I think that was the one thing everyone took from it is they went, there's something here. Even if it's not 100%, there's something here that we need to discuss. What I find really interesting is the conversations have expanded so far beyond that that I, I kind of, someone said to me, oh, I think this guy's just a plant. I think he's just here to distract us. I think he's just here to do this. And I said, if he did, it was a failure. Because I honestly think the people, we the people are smart enough that we pulled out the threads that were like, okay, that one's interesting, that one and that one. So let's discuss it and let's tie those threads together with some other threads and see where we go with this topic. Well, some of his narrative wasn't factual. Yeah. He made the attempt to tie the Kushner group directly to Bitcoin, that's not true. Yeah, there I, is a segment of the Kushner group run largely by Jared Kushner's brother that did an investment movement into technologies and they funded GitHub, which is the repository for the code on which all of this runs. So that's kind of an ancillary connection, but he mischaracterized that. Yeah. The slaving of GPU cycles inside of casinos is a really interesting and novel aspect to this. But uh -huh. why would it just be cas casinos? Exactly. Okay. It now it gets more interesting because all of a sudden you see an infrastructure that looks oddly, oddly Borg-like mm -hmm. <laughs> in the way that it is assembling itself. Now, <clears throat> I don't know if anybody's read the Satoshi white paper. No. The white paper is really just an overview. You would call it the, the kind of roadmap 
to the techno technological aspects of Bitcoin. It's not really a technical paper. Yeah. So in within that within the Satoshi paper, a number of suppositions of if things operate a certain way, including cryptographic standards, mm -hmm. which the cryptographic standard, the SHA, the secure hash algorithm, whatever number it is, I don't remember the number, uh, that, is, that is a CIA cipher with the NSA. Now, we can assume that that has a high level of um, invulnerability to brute force hacking, but the question is what runs even inside of that code? What runs inside of the code that runs on top of the system. You see, to understand Bitcoin blockchain, you have to also understand networks in general and the nature of what they're doing because you now have intermediaries in the blockchain itself, which is the peering system for this as an intermediary between servers and end users. You're peering much like uh, something like BitTorrent, Pirate Bay, that kind of thing. So the network topology is managed by routers, which themselves are also very smart machines. So when we look at all of this, the average person doesn't even know what questions to ask about this. And so to say, okay, uh, they're harvesting the GPU cycles on the floor of the casinos in Las Vegas. Again, it's an intriguing idea. My response to that was, well, of course, why would they not? And why would major Fortune 500 corporations not be doing the same as well? And why are we to assume that this is all novel, new, and hip because some techies have said so? Or have they been doing this for a long time? Well, we go back to CERN, and we know that CERN was running a very similar platform. This was actually not even the first time it was done. There were major universities going back even into the 90s that I know of that were using GP, CPU cycles coming off of computers that were networked over what was then basically dial-up. Yeah. So we have a long history of using this methodology, but with Bitcoin, this is, this is steroids. I mean, the kind of machines that are now doing the mining on the blockchain aren't your factory fresh, PCs anymore. These are the size of a dining room table with as many as 12 graphic processor units harnessed together with massive amounts of cooling to the point where they require external cooling uh, using oil or water cool system, something beyond just blowing fans on these suckers. Yeah. So we have massive energy consumption going into this, which we have not calculated yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all of this goes into, let's think a little deeper about this. That's why something like Quinn is useful, but you have to spit the bones out because this, there's clearly mischaracterizations and hyperbole in this narrative. Yeah. Right. So in, in Vegas, you're already at a, you know, 110 outside and you're right. heating your inside with these mining rigs. Well, the cooling facilities would be more apparent if that was true as a possibility. And that mining pool would show up in that, Danny, I sent you the graph or the pie chart of the mining yeah. uh, groups. Yeah. Even if that was all, all of Vegas was that unknown little sliver, it wouldn't affect the percentage of consensus in any measurable way. Okay, so you said consensus because this is a place I want to go. When, when you guys had the conversation with, with, with Cliff Hine, I had no concept, this was a new piece for me, is the concepts of consensus. That, that was a brand new, and it made me go, oh, wait. So we look at the idea, the concept of consensus. If they can get 51% of the miners to agree that this is what this is will be, then they have consensus and they can change or they can do what they want. The thing that came up for me is, of course, we got Saudi Arabia 
building these massive computational centers. And they showed some pictures in a couple of the videos showed some of these, like you say, floor to ceiling, monolith computers that are like just massive amounts. China doing the same thing. Russia purportedly doing the same thing. I can guarantee we know they're doing that kind of shit in the States. Are they trying to create a consensus? Are they getting to a point where they're like, if we can mine enough, if we can spend, because we have to think, okay, Bitcoin's gone, increased in value by an extreme amount. It's worth, I think, was it, is it still above eight today? Or it's over, it it's 7,000 7, something today. So it's 7,000 something. Yeah. When you take into consideration what Randy said, the amount of energy that they are using, the, in the cooling, the everything, does that value equate? Unless there is another reason to want to capture this value, to capture this mining, this Bitcoin, whatever operation, are they trying to overtake the consensus? So, okay. No, 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 go, go. So I have a couple of thoughts. Like, um, <laughs> this might seem kind of silly, but I'll go ahead and say it because I am afraid. Um, have you ever been into a casino in Las Vegas? It's fucking freezing in there. Right? I know. It's freezing in, casi in casinos. You see girls okay. in their little teeny outfits and you're like. <laughs> and the, they always say, well, the, the reason they keep it cold is to keep people awake and wanting to drink more so they'll stay gambling and stuff like that. But it's also um, a convenient, you know, yeah, like they, they, it, the places, it would be actually a really perfect house for computers that required a lot of cooling. And then the other, and I'm going to do my best to explain this in the way I understand it in my head. Sometimes it's hard to find the words. And Jeff, I think maybe you'll appreciate this. So I had this kind of hit that, oh, it's really interesting. Um, Bitcoin really started to take off and be developed and then move and become a thing about the same time CERN got turned on and rammed up and revved up. Mm -hmm. All right. And so one of the things that Quinn talks about in this video, but whether he talks about it or not, my, my, my thinking about this is kind of separate, is these locations of these things that are these circular things that are like hadron colliders in all of these areas where he thinks this is going on. Obviously, you know that CERN is the biggest one, right? And, and the one that they that focus on, on, right? But also, you have, they have smaller particle colliders at a lot of universities, a lot of these other places that are ganging computers. Check this out. Okay, so what if what CERN is really doing, or one of, they never do it for just one reason, but one of the things that they're able to accomplish with this is they're using all of that energy created by particle collision to be the thing that provides the energy to power these computers to mine the Bitcoins. Okay, so that is the actual reason of it. And, you know, that, you know we are all thinking it's okay, they're trying to, uh, we definitely know they're not trying to find the God particle. That was like the biggest ridiculous thing ever. But we're all thinking, okay, they're tearing holes of, in, they're trying to tear holes in the fabric of space and time to let things in from other dimensions. There are all this kind of stuff. And that could be true, but they, maybe that's the side effect of, try, of, of doing this, right? Or maybe they, they, maybe they know it'll do both. And so it makes it an even greater thing to do with it. So check this out. I have always felt that um, because of the Large Hadron Collider being in Switzerland and also because um, time being so closely close associated with Switzerland, I've always said that um, the United States controls the military, the Vatican controls religion, London controls finances, and Switzerland controls time. And I relate this to my, some of my uh, tying it to tennis and Roger Federer and stuff like that, right, Jeff? Okay. So also look at what the, um, the flag for Switzerland is. It's very close to what the Knights Templar sign looks like. It's the Red Cross. It's the light photon. It's all that kind of perception of time, is, you know, whatever. I actually now want to maybe, I'm thinking about moving my judgment and saying that, no, actually Switzerland controls both time and money because of the same connection that Cliff was talking about in our video. That right, at this point, time has become money. Where have all of the elite, rich people and elite stored their money in offshore bank accounts or you know, secret bank accounts? They've been doing it in Switzerland for a really, really, really long time. And if that is now the, the biggest Bitcoin farm, that would also tie those things together. And check this out. Jeff Gates, you sent me the article that said that the only time in recent history that anybody thinks they may have spotted Satoshi, uh, Satoshi Naramaki, whatever his name is, was when game set match was being called as Roger Federer won Wimbledon this year. To me, that is a symbolic impression, right? When, he, when, when Roger Federer wins, it is cementing the place of a certain faction of power over the control of time and money in this world. And so to me, we have to start looking at is the energy from these, these, these projects really being used to all, either for the purpose of mining Bitcoin or to also mine Bitcoin? And, and are all these other things just side effects of that? Um, how does this relate to um, 
things like the Mandela or the Toto effect, right? Like this is the whole, I had that huge hit this week and I'm like, oh, this is so funny because I started thinking about it because of Jeff and Jeff had been the one to initially send me the article <laughs> saying that Satoshi was, was, was spotted at Game Set Match Better. So, okay. So if my theory is right, then this is proof that my theory is right. You know what I mean? And think about it. That happened in um, the end of June or early July of this summer, which is really when Bitcoin started to make massive movement. Okay. So there you go. So um, let it be known. Yes, I have invested into this crypto space with the intent to, um, to invest into the token companies that are going to change our financial paradigm. But, as Emily just uh, expressed, I am always looking for the co-op because I understand what a created reality is. So I'm not with respect to Emily. I'm going to just kind of go between her and I's perspective. So her intention, I'm speaking for you, but you have wrote this on text. Yeah. Your intu intuition says no. My intu intuition said yes. So you're not taking action where I did take action. And your reality is giving you data points to co corroborate your, your perception. And in my reality, I'm getting data points that say that, you know, acknowledge my perception so and then danny's coming forward and saying okay all of this soup regardless of where we think it is what do we do with this information yeah because humans are crafty and i do not believe any of this ai scare tactic that ai can control us we can never crack the code uh, it's beyond thinking uh, that we can, I don't, you know, and I'm going to say Anthony Patch, he's all about, <laughs> they've recreated the brain synapses in his global simulator, but I know I have more brain material in my belly, so they have a long way to go to even replicate that, and then you get into the whole metaphysical thing of what our humanness is. So the scare tactic um, uh, that ha crafty humans can't figure this out and guide it in a direction because I don't see it stopping, but it's what we do with it and expose it because, you know, following Danny and Lisa's show all those years, they were really good about Ex making something transparent and the whole thing took a new direction. I'll just speak for my experience on Lisa and Danny's show. Although I have watched off planet the whole time too. <laughs> so, uh, um, so it's about your reality and, and uh, it's not necessarily a belief system because I think we're all uh, bright humans trying to figure out what this is and what is this mining doing at gigahertz speeds all over the planet metaphysically? That's yeah. a huge question. Yeah. Let me just real quickly respond. Um, I really appreciate your comments and I'm, um, I, this is like, I don't know how to say this in the, in the way that exactly is. I'm not complete. I'm not, in some ways, I'm not even anti-Bitcoin. I'm not afraid of it. I'm not afraid of artificial intelligence. There was a time when I was afraid of artificial intelligence, but I have worked through that. And I agree with you that we humans have a certain le level of creative, in creative intelligence that no technology could, could replicate. So I'm not afraid of it. I think for me, the, it's just I don't see this as a better thing than what we have right now. And, and, and I, you know... I kind of feel like, okay, we're going with this idea, well, it's not perfect, but it's a little bit better than what we have right now, or it's the only way to prevent what's happening with the other thing that like delays coming up with something that is actually a holistically beneficial solution for individuals and for the humanity as a whole and whatnot. Um, I'm not anti-Bitcoin and I'm not like, I, I don't, um, I don't think people who are, in, have a lot of Bitcoin are like wrong or bad. And um, I, so I completely respect your position and actually agree with 
a, a lot of it. Um, and I do, I, I, I partake, but what you just said about the whole metaphysics of all of this, of what is happening because of this mining and all of the energy, that's like where a really important part of this conversation is. And when people don't completely understand how something, how something works and what is really behind it, then they're not able to have a complete level of, I don't really know what the word is here, but like it's affecting them metaph metaphysically. They're being affected metaphysically by something they don't completely understand, which is the case all along but this one seems really high this seems like it brings together so many things that affect one metaphysically because it deals with the aspect of money it deals with the aspect of technology it deals with the aspect of one's attention to and intention with something mm -hmm. and so i just feel like there needs to be a lot more discussion and clarity and thought put behind whether or not this is a good thing i'm not saying that it isn't well okay, this is, okay that was one of the things that cliff said yeah, okay jeff go ahead okay so, um, okay, I want to go to just glean that little bit about uh, jumping uh, to a holistic solution. I understand we're, quote, 7 billion humans on this planet. And this group, the group that is aware, 1%, 3% population of Bitcoin, is aware that there is a change coming. But uh, when you start to have Bitcoin conversations with uh, strangers, your, your uh, dry cleaner or whatever, um, I'll speak from my experience. When they fi find out that I have some knowledge, they come at me, Jeff, I I've got $10,000, make me a million dollars. And I go, whoa, 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 whoa. That's the wrong intent. Uh, you're, you're, with that intent, you're going to, send it to the wrong Bitcoin address and you're going to lose it. You know, uh, universe is going to step in with that intent. Look at Danny and I's video and let me spell out the intent that I'm going after. And the wealth effect is a side effect. So it's an assertion point for the sleepies uh, to become aware of the entrapment of the matrix fiat system. Mm -hmm. Now, you can't, for those sleepies, you can't go from fiat debt and death to Ubuntu in one fell swoop. No. That is a violating their free will choice. Um, so I see Bitcoin as an insertion, insertion step Agreed. to people becoming aware of the problem, becoming responsible, and then it, it grows to something new. I am not, you know, this is not the end result because we know Bitcoin can be forked, which it has many, many times. Better ideas are coming. Cliff's last little uh, re interview yesterday, uh, the graph rail ledger, it has no network effect yet and won't even come online for another three to four years. So we already know there's going to be a stepping stone path into even better and better ways. But at least I wanted to get my saved and stored value that I worked 24 years at a company for in the matrix. I wanted to get it out of the debt and death system. I cashed out my 401k. I walked my talk and I, I have a whole bunch of risk and maybe some wealth effect as a, as a reward, but I wanted to at least get that transitionary stepping stone out of the system that is enslaving us and killing us, and I know you already know that, so. Well, that's what I wanted to say, right? Cliff made some really good points in that discussion, and, it, and it, I brought it right back to the discussion that you and I had, Jeff, in September about the intent. Do I trust Bitcoin? Not even fucking slightly. Not even a little bit. I have zero interest in being in owning Bitcoin at all. Now, some of the cryptocurrencies that have come along, some of these altcoins are interesting. And we are seeing some very, very cool projects are appearing and are coming up to give us an ability. So to go back to what I said back in May when I talked about Bitcoin and, and a special that I did then. 
I don't believe it's the be all end all. I don't believe it's the savior that a lot of people are trying to put it in this up on that like little altar there and they oh it's the savior it's going to rescue us all. I don't believe that. I believe it's completely controlled. The Fed they all they fucking own it lock stock and barrel. But we have an ability in the same way that you have the ability to go play in the stock market. Really? You have a startup company. And if you have a startup company and offers a, a, an ICO and they've got something that's really cool that they want to do and you go, oh, I love this fucking project. You know what? I want to see this project come to fruition. And in, to help it along, I'm going to buy $100 of their coin. I'm going to invest that $100 to help move that incredible project forward. The intent that we use when we go into this, I think makes all the difference in the world. People talk about dollars being evil. The dollar is evil. But really, the intent is what do you do with the dollar? Or do you feed someone who's homeless? Or do you go and feed like the corporate McDonald's machine with it, right? What we do, every single thing that we call as a tool has an intent behind it and it's how we use those tools. I think that as a bridge, like you said, Jeff, as a bridge to something else, I think the cryptocurrencies, again, not Bitcoin per se, the cryptocurrencies, offer us an opportunity to bring a lot of awareness out because it opens the conversation about fiat and who owns and what is value, and et cetera, et cetera. Gives us an opportunity to help projects that we want to get off the ground and help ourselves too, because at the, the end of the day, we all have to feed our families. We all have to put a roof over our head. We all have to put gas in the gas tank. And whether you do that with a dollar, a fiat dollar bill, or you do that with a cryptocurrency coin, in the end run, does it matter? That's my whole thing. I'm, when it comes down to, I have to feed my family, if someone wants to send, sends you a donation of $10 and someone else sends you $10 worth of cryptocurrency, it puts food on your table. The intent is what you do with it. And I think that that was one of the, one of the points that I really, uh, I appreciated Cliff High talking about. Is it the be all end all? No fucking way. Because it is just, I'm sorry, it's an empty system. It really is. And I got the cliff was trying to explain where the value was, et cetera. It's an empty system. It's valueless. That's not what we're going for. But I think it, as far as the, the, the altcoins, there could be some interesting bridges there that could offer some interesting benefits. Across I think one thing, yeah, I think one thing that cliff didn't make, maybe he doesn't, he didn't enunciate or just didn't come across right now with only 1% of the planet in a startup, Bitcoin is still a startup. Yep. It is considered this wealth thing just because so few have some and have converted their fiat to it. But once there's mass adoption, I don't, know that the value is even a consideration it's just an exchange mechanism of value yeah that's the end result of cryptos in in my perspective yeah. and we're you know the 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 conversations right now are over a startup that hasn't even spun up and is actually doing things that it is intend. These tokens we're investing, I'm investing in. I mean, we're still three to six months out before there's any product. Um, so that's just a side note. And, and in that, your guys' conversation, it kind of alluded that you have to mine Bitcoin and fuck no. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know anybody that's doing that because as Randy started to point out, those mining rigs are a hell of expensive and technical and um, that's, that's not in anybody, any normal guy's purview. So. Well, it is for Litecoin and some of the other smaller altcoins. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, that's perfectly feasible. Again, I, I need to stake out that I have been transactionally, transactionally neutral with Bitcoin, but I've been looking at Bitcoin since 2012 and grokking it. That said, there isn't a fear factor to that. It is watching something evolve and develop, which has now mushroomed on the landscape of this level. Mm -hmm. Remember that the average person out there anywhere in the world, they're not having this conversation. They don't even know how to have this conversation. So we're in the formative stages of something where the value of the conversation we're having is the perspectives that each one of us is sharing because they're very unique. And in aggregate, you know, from your perspective as somebody who is bought into Bitcoin, from the perspective of other people who are standing on the sidelines looking at it or the people who are analyzing it, this is all data that needs to filter out there because the mainstream will never touch this. But it's very clear that everything is pushing blockchain separate from Bitcoin into a position to be a model that's a monster on steroids. Um, something popped up on my screen earlier. UPS is now developing a blockchain strategy to quote, disrupt the delivery system, meaning that I think they're looking at this as a way to expedite their own systems. So yeah. this isn't just a money system. No. And this is a really important point again. We're not dealing with money here. We're dealing with information. We have been dealing with information since the 80s because we've been in a digital banking system nominally since the 80s and ramping up through the 90s. By 2000, we're there. So whatever form it takes, we've been in digital for nigh over 20 years. Now, the abstraction in all of this is that we're now adopting a different model. We're moving away from centralized institutional models into the disruptive models. The disruptive models are networked, distributed, non-hierarchical in theory, but they do have the gatekeepers. Anybody that's worked in the tech world knows the hierarchical system. Don't fuck with the sysadmin. And that's the way it goes. Now, as Cliff defined it, and as Satoshi's white paper defines it, that 51% of the miners are the consensus. They are the ones that call the shots on the networks. So you now have a tech, you have a technocracy that has already presented itself. I'm not saying that with fear. I've worked in IT departments. I've been around the tech field for 30 years. All I'm saying is understand you're dealing with a different model than what you had before. You're not going to deal with the banker and the cubicle anymore. You're going to argue, well, you're going to contractually negotiate with an agent a software agent that works. And this is the part of it that tips towards AI, but it's not AI. You're dealing with something that computationally moves faster than you do, aggregates data faster than you do, has access to infinitely larger pools of knowledge, which it can recall nearly instantaneously. We will give you a credit decision in 2.5 seconds. Boom, done. So, the Federal Reserve talks about the velocity of money. They haven't seen anything yet. The velocity of this system is literally a torrent. Now, we have to be prepared to deal with this reality. And come up with, for the, the average public, yeah. to even know the questions to ask. Because like you said, this is alien. This, we might as well call this alien tech. Because the average public has no comprehension of this. Look. You know, at, I'm help trying to help friends just by, you know, PayPay on Ether Delta, and that literally takes three evenings to walk them through it. It is not easy yet. This is all digital fuckery until 
uh, the system gets mature enough that it's all, you know, put your finger on your bank account and move it to a token GUI thing. Um, now, Randy, you, you almost got there where uh, people in, in that sense, that they're going to have to get used to what is called a smart contract. You're actually writing out what you intend for a transaction to do. I want to apply for a mortgage for this house. And as you have to take responsibility in that little crypto smart contract of what you intend to fulfill in the agreement. And then the other half accepts that smart contract or not. And it's black or white because the speed that that transaction is going to happen, there's no room for error. So that, in essence, makes everybody responsible for their own actions instead of paying a middleman. Randy, we can't hear you. You're not muted. Say something. I think we hear you. Okay, yep. so. Yep. All right, so I lost my train of thought. Damn it. Smart um, contract. The smart contract. Why do we have to call it a smart contract? Why is everything fucking smarter than we are? Why do we have smartphones? Why do we have smart devices? Why is the thermostat on my wall in there supposedly smarter than I am? See, right away, we're assigning a less than status to the human who has to operate at normal synaptic rates. That's part of my problem with it. Yeah. So I'm not going at you personally, Jeff. I'm putting this out there as my blast to everybody who denigrates human intelligence to that level and thinks an algorithm is better. But having said that, I'll go back to one thing. You said it was black and white. That's the point. There's no negotiation with a machine. You go on to, I talk to companies all the time. Once they put you through a voicemail system, you get into a loop. You talk to somebody there. That person has a decision tree in front of them on a computer screen. They do not make decisions. The decisions are fed to them as a script with a logic laced behind it. There's no human interaction anymore. And the part of this that's even more difficult is we are making, we're not adding another abstraction layer to something that's incredibly human. And that is the transaction of values between people. A one-to-one -one purchase situation has an eye-to-eye -eye contact, the sense of value of something that's being offered and something that's being purchased. And it's being purchased, albeit in an abstract system using what we call fiat currency, but that currency represents tactile energy that we function through. Now we have to learn to function through a system which no longer utilizes the idea that, I'm sorry, I can't pay 36.9 for that car, but I can drop it down to 3,200, work with me on this. And see, more and more the systems will become so autonomous that we'll no longer have that. We remove the value of every transaction relegated to the agent inside of the machine as opposed to the agents that have populated our business world for the last 200 years since the Industrial Revolution. And that's, that's kind of what it is. There's a huge abstraction layer that's being placed here without a lot of thought. And, and that's the thought I want to provoke. I'm not, a, this isn't even me railing against this looming system I see so much as warning that we will lose something in this. The humanity. Yeah, yeah the humanity of it. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that, I think that, I'll speak for myself, but probably, also, like the conversation with Danny was that that is our biggest, I think that is my biggest concern is this, this over-reliance on th this idea that technological things are just as or more real than human things is, is I think, the underlying disturbing issue for me. So that, you know, Crow 777 has been on this, you know, <laughs> infantile adult rant lately. And... Um, Tavistock reducing uh, humanity into diapers. Yeah. Diapers, right? Yeah. And so your point is taken, Randy, that if you if you call this a smart contract and 
the humanities removed out of it, uh, that's a problem. That is a Tavistock agenda. So in these types of conversations that even Catherine Austin Fitz is, is starting to go to these block uh, chain conferences, uh, how do you make sure the human plan is, is, is kept in this? Um, and that's, that's absolutely valid. Well, that's, I mean, we, this is a, okay, this is a major point of the conversation because we talk about everything is becoming dehumanizing. Nick, my husband taught every time we have to travel and you have to travel across the border. He says, international travel is dehumanizing. me. It, it is, you, you are just treated to the point, I'm sure cattle get treated better. Yeah. And it's, like, it's like you're a commodity being traded and inspected and, and, and assigned it, a value and all that shit. Yep. And, and no humanity. Like there's, there's no, like, you might as well be talking to a bot. The last time I had to go through the States and deal with the TSA, I was like, mm -hmm. hello, are you human? Should I check you for a pulse? Because I don't think you have one. And it's dehumanizing. When you, have to, when you have a problem with your PayPal account and you have to go through and call in and you get the auto robot, well, give us, the, well, give us this. And it's dehumanizing. Like you get to the point at the end, you lose. I lose my shit and end up yelling into the phone, customer service, customer service. So we get sooner or later, if I repeat it enough, Finally, the robot will get frustrated with me and will actually put me through to a human. It's dehumanizing. That lowering of humanity down to the diaper level, kind of like what you just said. And is that the AI? Like this is everything we're seeing now, especially since I said 2015 was the year of AI. It was the introduction of Sophia and, and Siri and fucking, I don't know, Facebook. Alexa and everyone, yes, all these. <laughs> right? And all of a sudden now you're talking to a this, you know, disembodied voice, but everyone's doing it. Like the, it's you becoming programmed to accept this, accept this. There's no more humans going to talk to you. Now you're, all you're going to have is this disembodied robotic machine intelligence. It wears, and you have to look at it again. We've talked about the transhumanism. We talked about that at the very, very beginning, Emily. I think before Jeff and even Randy even showed up. Yeah. Is that part of it? Is, are we looking at a crossover agenda in this that brings us into a new level of, of if they can integrate us in, with technology externally enough that they can convince us to integrate the same technology internally? I, I that yeah, absolutely. That and also this goes to the part of the conversation we were talking about. You know, while we have to separate things like AI, nanotechnology, and transhumanism, we have to have a complete understanding of how they're connected to each other, how they interact, and how they complement each other. Because if we're dealing with a system right now where we have a, a, a digital currency based on blockchain that is somehow tied in with artificial intelligence, whether it's sentient or not. And we also have the stuff that is going on with the 5G and the Internet of Things and the nanotechnology inside of our bodies, there, which we know, which we know is there. Um, you know, I think that there are things we can do to flush our bodies of them, to, make, to turn them off, to make it dormant. But we know that they're constantly trying to stream that into our bodies. What is the interaction between those things? Yes. And is this, you know, you know, how are we being affected physically, mentally, psychologically, physiologically, on a neurosynaptic level, on a subtle energy in the body level, on a metaphysical level. These are things, the, the, I think this is where more of my concern is. It isn't just like, is this good or is it bad? Is this morally right or morally wrong? It's this whole, to me, this feels, and Randy had a great post this week where he questioned, is this not so much about currency money-wise, but is it about an energetic buy-in to a system that is, you know, AI, that is basically an artificial, intelli the intelligent or an internet of things kind of system. I don't want my body to be part of the internet of things. No. I don't want that. And you know what I mean? And, and integrating money with technology and artificial intelligence and stuff like that, 
creates a situation that ties people even further emotionally to those technologies, right? Because people, what they're usually most emotional and concerned about, whether it's, you know, what is, is their money? You know what I mean? People will defend their money sometimes. Well, that's what Cliff was saying to us about the fact that essentially once you take somebody's emotional responses away, they can't make decisions anymore. We don't like to say this, but we make decisions based on emotions. Our emotion may be that that's the most logical solution, but that's still an emotional response at the end of the thing because anybody that runs decision trees and, and does logic sequences knows that there are variables within all of that that can change at any turn, much like the system itself, that the emotional component is how we make our decisions. And it becomes a question of how autonomous does this all become? Hmm. Oh, the questions. Oh, the fucking questions. Um, I want to jump back a bit. I want to jump back a bit. We got because we were talking about the whole CERN stuff, and we we're talking about the power, etc. Because I do believe that this ties into everything. And I always joke, they, the quintessential they, don't do something for one reason if they can do it for ten reasons. Right. No if they come up with ten reasons to do this one thing, they will. Right. So when we look at CERN, and we've looked at all. Like God knows, I know all of us have torn this apart for years now. Just, what are they opening dimensional portals, crashing black holes? They're they're causing the Mandela effect. They're, we've been through all of them. One of the pieces, and I don't know if this was ever proven or not, because it was a piece of research I'd done many years ago, is that CERN was using as the, as the creators of the internet was basically using backdoors into every single person's computer to crunch their numbers, mm -hmm. right? Which is what we're kind of, we're, we've just already been talking about. This, this is the concept that here we're talking about blockchain and how you, know, you have these things. I, I joked just last week, I had to clear 26 Trojans out of my computer, 26. And when I talked to a tech friend of mine, he was like, yeah, you know, those were probably all bit miners. They were all probably like Bitcoin based miner. This yeah, bot networks. One yeah. of these bot networks that's gone in and they're, they're using your, your processing speed. And our website has been, um, RTS Earth has been under massive attack. And they've been doing the same thing to us. Someone finally broke through the firewall last month. If through, like we said, Randy, they've already been doing this shit. How long has CERN been around? How long has the internet been around? If they've already been doing this, the network is already there. The, the network is already in place. Of how well, you know, but the, the interesting thing is the network was already there. What was missing was the people. They needed us to build better, stronger. DARPANET, DARPANET itself, which was attached to the universities, and the academic system, which is how CERN plays into this, was a very limited topology as it, when it started out, with no real incentive to grow beyond its own requirements. But the technology was already there. It was already in place, and it was simply waiting for the next level, which was open the doors and bring them in. Because then we built the web, which is separate from the internet. The, I can tell you because I was in consulting in the 90s with a company who had hardware software products that were used to digitize massive troves of documents, government documents, financial institutions, banks, law firms, genealogy societies. <laughs> there was a massive sell. I know. I mean, that was my Bitcoin then. I made a lot of money. I made a shit ton load of money in that period selling and setting up these systems and doing consulting work. So I can tell you the massive effort that went into building the World Wide Web and the information, putting the bones on the system was an ad hoc venture that was done publicly through a public-private consortium. In other words, it was legislated and then people were brought in and then other people came in and other people went, wait, we need to add this. Let's digitize this. We built the World Wide Web for them. So when you look at Facebook now, 
you see something that you helped build because you're part of it. They needed you to be there. And I, I, know, I want to put that out there that we're building this system, either passively or actively. We are all contributing to it in some form. Yeah. And that's the component that gives it value. Hmm. I may have just made an argument for Bitcoin having said that. <laughs> but, but, but that also goes to your point about it being an energetic buy-in. All of these things, all of these systems, all of these technologies, for them to become functional in the way that whoever's creating the system or the network intends them to be, it needs us to energetically buy in and start participating. You know what I mean? And sometimes we end up doing that before we even question or ask ourselves a question. Is this really a smart thing? I think there's a lot of us who recognize now that if we had understood we were helping the CIA surveil us all so well by doing what we do on Facebook, we probably would not. The stock market at one time was a private club. And while it effectively yeah. still is. But remember that there was a day and it wasn't that long ago, the average person was not in the stock market. I mean, all these financial models 401ks and all these investment strategies that platform off of stocks largely came about late 1960s they began but really in earnest tanked up between the mid 70s to the 90s that was when people started to talk about things like IRAs and things like that as investment vehicles the average person had a passbook savings account they had some investments through insurance companies and other types of investments, largely through what they purchased in their life, which was their homes and things like that. We live in a really sophisticated world now financially. So you have to historically look and see how they built this. The stock market booms and busts, by the way, and let's not forget that about the tech industry because we're talking about the tech wow. industry, where the, where the cycles of people coming into the system and the transiting that took place and all the money that was made by these agents, these um, investment brokers and bankers and people like that who shepherded the crowd into the big bullpen called the stock market. Mm. That's how you got the Dow into the thousands in the first place. It was yeah. never going to get there before. So again, it's an energetic buy-in that requires a mass number of participants, not all of whom are equal in terms of what they're going to yield out of a system. Okay, now here's the thing, though. We talk about intent, right? So, and I love, Emily, that you brought up Facebook because that was exactly the example I was going to use. Facebook is a crock shit. It's a harvesting tool. It is a spy network. It is, we know it. I, Granted, when we first got on Facebook, we may not have fully grasped all right. of that. But as we've gone through our journey through Facebook, we've all grasped that that's what it is. YouTube is fucking corrupt. <laughs> I mean, seriously. They have fucked every one of us over on this screen, I guarantee. Right? We know it's yep. a tool. We know it's manipulated. But we choose to use both those tools. That's true. We use those tools. And I think everyone is here in this room and whoever's watching this video will know that at some point in time in Facebook, you put a post up and you were able to ping someone, someone who all of a sudden went, wait, what, what, what do you mean? What? We've used it as a tool. The only reason I've stayed on Facebook for as many years as I have is because of the fact, every time I think about the fact that well, we can go to all these other private networks like Seam and um, a lot of these other ones, but then it's all the awake people together. In which case, you're not reaching out to anyone new. We use Facebook as a tool to reach out to people. We use YouTube as a tool to reach out to a certain audience. The intent with what we use it. For me, I mean, I, made, I sacrificed my privacy a long time ago and knew I was sacrificing my privacy a long time ago to Facebook. And I made the informed choice to say, I'm going to make the choice to keep going this way because when I weigh it personally, it's better that I can use it as a platform than to walk away from it. So there's an intent there as well. And I think it, that's one of those things that we keep coming back into is, is a tool, you know, the whole thing that gun, guns don't kill people, people kill people, right? Yeah. The fiat dollar is corrupt, 
It is our intent, though, in how we use those tools. And I think that is one of the big pieces to this that uh, they don't grasp. I think it's one of the pieces that they just, and maybe that's even one of those pieces that it, even artificial intelligence, that thing that doesn't have sentience, that doesn't have emotional, that it can't grasp is the intent to it. Right. So, so far, uh, this conversation, I know, Danny, you, you, you like solutions. So we, we have questions, right? We want to know the Tavistock ag agenda at this crypto space, removing hin human interaction. I want to know where they're going and to change that. I think Roger Veer and all these guys should be held to task as these main developers. Now, wait a minute. Remember, this is a human interaction and don't just delete it off the planet. Um, the energetic buy-in, I'm asking the universe, what is that? Uh, show me where my energy is being siphoned off. Uh, maybe you can go as far as uh, what is the agreement of entrapment in this crypto space? Because I know it's not debt. I haven't seen terms and conditions. I haven't seen use of force. And I haven't, except for the gain of wealth, seen an enticement per se to do something inhuman yet. yet. So I'm asking, you know, I, I guess that's what I grok so far in this conversation is those three questions. So uh, Jeff, I think, I think those are great questions. And I, 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 I actually, in a, in a lot of ways, really like your point of view and your perspective on this and the questions you're asking. I guess this is where, I, again, this is something that maybe only would come up for someone who is aware of so many things informationally going on on many different levels. But this is like where I see my concern with it. Like I can understand the benefits of like, okay, if you're a person like I, I actually completely get from you, even though I don't know you very well, that you're not a person run by money. Like I understand why you're doing this and your intent behind it. And so this isn't me speaking to you. And I fully trust my ability to, if I were to say, okay, I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy some Bitcoin because I'm a person, I'm really good at saving money, but unfortunately we don't get interest in the bank. So if I were going to say, okay, I'm going to buy some Bitcoin so that I can actually do something. It's like investing your money so I can grow my money because I want to use that money to create the kinds of conscious communities that I'm interested in or to work on projects. So, and if this is something I've been through, like I, I've not spent, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Okay, I'm not a person run by money, so I may be able to do, okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to set it over here. I'm going to let that grow. I'm going to use it for things that I passionately care about, and I'm not going to allow myself to be run, for, run by it. And that, I think, is probably really in some ways what you're doing as well. My concern comes when, and this goes to the conversations we all have on our shows, conversations that I know Danny and Lisa used to deeply get into about the construct and things like that. My concern is that, you know, people are always worried that they're going to turn off the internet. And there was a time when I was worried about that kind of thing too. Now my concern is more that what, what if we come to a spot where we understand that a lot of this fuckery going on in the world, a lot of like internet of things kind of crap and artificial intelligence and the things that are being used to hold this sort of matrix or construct in place is reliant on the internet being on. And what if we, as the awake, you know, 1% people here who are trying to move us to a better place, at some point think, come to the conclusion that, oh, at least temporarily, maybe we need to turn this shit off, right? Like, I, I, I fully believe that, uh, just as you said, intent behind tech, technology can be used for wonderful things, but we know that a lot of the fuckers who hold the highest stakes and the highest claims in the technology and the internet and whatever are, isn't my friend Danny Katz and say nefarious fuckwads, right? We know that. So, you know, we may, in order to interrupt their plans, come to the conclusion that at least temporarily we need to do something to disrupt the technology, to turn the internet off. You have a lot of people who maybe aren't as emotionally balanced when it comes to money or as uh, spiritually awake when it comes to money, who, 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 who might know all of the things we know, but then find themselves defending the system because they have their money wrapped up in Bitcoin. 
And so that's, I guess that is in a lot of ways my greatest concern. Now, I, if I had Bitcoin, and I fully believe this about you, and we both came to the conclusion that in order to save ourselves, we need to turn this shit off, we would gladly turn it off and fuck over and say, but not everybody is that way. And a lot of these people that I see that are in this latest wave of people getting into Bitcoin, including the drone bot that was sent in my, to my work to give me some sort of harassment about Bitcoin, they're not. They're run by money. Even though they might know all this other stuff, their emotional attachment to money and their misunderstanding of what value currency and energy actually truly are on a metaphysical level will lead them to defend a system that for every other reason they would be against. That is my main concern. And so I like, you know, I'm still not going to, at this point, I'm not saying I'll never, never do the Bitcoin thing. But for me, some of these concerns have to be addressed, talked about. And I think that's what, conversations like this. And I have a feeling there are going to be many more. I would love to have a conversation just with you privately, Jeff, where we can hash out some of this, because I feel like just energetically, I feel like we're on a similar level with some of these kinds of things, even though we are handling it differently. These are really important conversations. Maybe the solution to this is that, you know, we have communities that, that you know, we have some communities that participate in Bitcoin and some that don't. And then there's a, a, a exchange of value between those. For, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. Like, I, don't, I don't know what the solution is. I'm open to considering all things. But my main concern is that so many people haven't really come to terms with their relationship with money. Absolutely agree. And I think those drone bots, as you say, I think they will lose their money because yeah. even, even since Danny and I did our show, um, I have some really brilliant unfuckers that are approaching me, me with all the Bitcoin Ponzi scheme tokens and like BitConnect and BitPetite and all the scams that if you give this company one Bitcoin, they will increase your portfolio 1% a day. And I, I don't know if Cliff addressed that on your show, but um, if you just do compound interest, a person with said 10 Bitcoins will have a billion, or a billion dollars in five years. It's a Ponzi scheme. And those people with that type of intent will just be their intent, their, I think the universe kind of steps in and will teach them the lesson that they need to learn until they understand the value because I, you know, we of course have a, a collective majority that doesn't even understand the money system. And in this, this change of cryptos that seems to be manifesting, they're going to learn responsibility for their actions in that transport system uh, is, is, is my view of it. Um, uh, that said, there's so many ways you can copy Bitcoin in that it never has a value of even a penny in like, I live in Ashland, Oregon. It could be Ashland coin. It never holds a value. It's just a marker of a, a exchange of value. So you can do all sorts of different things without attaching this money to it. Have you yeah. heard of um, mountain hours? Mm -mm. Like no. it's something I, I haven't I haven't heard about it in a long time in a while. But like really like just before the whole Bitcoin thing got big, like I was hearing about there's like some. Uh, communities like I don't know if it's whole cities or counties in Colorado that you said huh? away. 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 Uh, uh, Don can you okay. mute please it's just muted okay go okay. ahead um, so mountain hours was like a thing I think it was running in certain areas of Colorado where people could have like you know you get your paycheck and you have it direct deposited you could have some of it you could have a portion of it direct deposited into this thing called mountain hours where you would go and exchange hours you worked for products and goods so it's, it was like creating a barter system um and so to me like that is a more direct version of what we're talking you know like what you just described jeff like this is a this is a situation that takes most of the um technological and artificial intelligence aspect of the possibility out of it. So to me that like, you know, in our own communities, you know, maybe, maybe 
it would be one thing if we were developing in our own communities, something like mountain hours at the same time that we were developing these cryptocurrencies to deal with people who are long distances away or to deal with like corporations or whatever. I think if I saw a parallel development of think local peer to peer communities exchanging things without technology at the same time I was seeing this, I'd feel more comfortable. I feel like people were balanced and understood what the actual uh, purpose and value behind it was. And so maybe that's something that these conversations can spark. We need to start having more uh, developing systems in our communities that are something like mountain hours, whether, whether they be between uh, just in our physical communities or even in our online communities. And then understand that we use that whenever we can and we use the cryptocurrency for things that are not able to be done that way. That's something that I would feel a lot more comfortable with than just cryptocurrency is the answer. You're Absolutely. muted. Absolutely. And, and Catherine Austin Fitz, you know, that software that she got stolen from her, uh, the community model, um, it really, it, it showed you your community and the inputs and outputs of it. And if you expanded that, you saw that, what, there's $21 trillion missing from the U.S. budget. But if you cryptoize that in, in a way that, uh, sorry, if you blockchained it, not crypto monetar monetized it, uh, it it's, a, it's a ledger that everybody can see that you're just, it's kind of like a, a community Craigslist in that infinite detail that you can't even post on Craigslist. So we're still missing a big picture of each community somewhere on the web, right? I have this to offer. There's still not that nth detail out there so that the, the barter system through a blockchain could manifest in that way. So there's all these great ideas we only have a thousand copies of tokens on the Ethereum network right now. So this is, we're just starting. And if Cliff's right, we have 40,000 by the, by the spring. Those are the type of tokens that we would want to see created and maybe we create them. Yeah. Time management, time banking, which is what that, that mountain, yeah, uh, time banking. Sorry. That's what it is. Yeah, it's Ithaca time, and there's Berkshire Bucks, etc. It's all about time banking. Really, and I've actually looked heavily into this uh, back when I first started RTS Earth because I said this is kind of one of the things that I want to do. Doing that through somehow with the blockchain, I could actually see be a very interesting way of of taking it out of the small communities and being able to actually expand it on a global community level. Right. I think, I think it needs to have levels though. I do think we need to be doing more locally and uh, use locally the thing, uh, things that can be done locally should be done locally. And then we should only use the other things for the things we can't be done locally. If I was seeing a, a, a development of a system that was tiered and, and like that, then that would be something I would have much more interest in. Because I think one of the dangers of this, aside from all the other ones we discussed, is that it, it's another step in like breaking down connection and communication between people in real face-to-face you know situations and so i feel like we have to we would be a lot more um balanced and responsible in our use of the technology if we didn't use it to solve problems that could be solved face to face and locally yeah, yeah like right now go ahead jeff like right now amazon's taking over the united states with kill off the small business uh -huh. yeah. and centralize it and alibaba's in china's doing exactly the opposite they're just, uh, you know, consolidating the web presence of the small business so that you are still buying locally. And Al Alibaba's model is going to win in the end, in my opinion. But we're going to have to go through a come to Jesus moment with Amazon. Right, we're all going to have to break our addiction to Amazon and start, oh start pulling out of that for sure. It is, it's gross. I mean, like there are, they're firing cashiers and stores now. They're just going to have stores where you walk in and pay for everything with your, like, they're already gross. there. I mean, even before, yeah. when I, just before I left Canada, which was five years ago, they were, you know, go through and bag your own groceries, weigh your own produce, punch in your numbers and, you know, feed your money in your card in and, and no this more. Is, 
this isn't even going to be like that. This is going to be like that shit you see, you know, when you're in the airport and you see like the vending machine that is like the best buy vending machine. Th that's what this is going to be more like. There's not even going to be any people in there. It's just going to be like, oh, you hold your phone up to this. It drops your thing out. You get that. It, it of course also keeps an internet record then of everything you've ever bought. So if you know what I mean, it, it leads to some of the other concerns we talked it's about. It's basically a vendor mat, which is what you had in the sixties in yeah. New York. Auto mats. Yeah. Auto mats. I, I remember yeah. I, they, I, yeah. even, I remember as a kid being in New York and going into a Horn and Hard Arts Cafe that was automated. There were, no, there were no people there other than some people in the back that brought out fresh coffee or stuffed chips on the machine. It was all machines. This isn't new. Right. It's, it's, the, it's on another level, but it's not really yeah. new. It, the way it integrates with everything else is what's new. The way exactly like, yeah. the, the level those automats, of which it's expanding is new. Like those, a, uh, those now. yeah, those automats were not recording who was eating what and you know at what time and how many calories were in it and comparing that to what they ate the day before to see if they're a fatter fuck or skinnier fuck than they were yesterday or you know what I mean <laughs> like that that's where this is and isn't feeding information to the insurance company to say oh this person ate two donuts today you should up their insurance rate and you know what I mean? like that's where this is all going. We are we are becoming part of the internet of things. And that, that is the thing that I need think needs to be resisted. I think any of these so, technologies could be used beneficially. Awesome. But I don't want to be part of the internet of things. The, I'm not a thing. <laughs> Sorry, Andy. The, the equations here have to do with, again, are we looking at a system or are we trying to build a system based on one model that right now is very explosive? In other words, once we cede to that system, is that the system that we have and do we build on it? Or do we have, do we have alternatives? Um, I don't think the current infrastructure of the blockchain system is sustainable energy-wise. You're talking about gigawatts, gigahertz of, of electrical power being used to mine coins. That's not going to go away even once they finish mining the coins because you still have to verify the blockchain continuously. Yeah. You need a network to do that. So from an energy standpoint, is this sustainable? And then let's flip this around. If you wanted to revolutionize the world really, and you wanted to use this kind of system, we're running on a carbon model. We're using petrofuse, coal, and God forbid, nuclear. And it, none of this has anybody said, say, you know, it would be really nice if we had free energy cold fusion so that we could run these things without the overhead of the carbon footprint. And I'm not using that in the, in the globalist sense. I'm using it in the sense that, yes, we are consuming Reality. resources. We're, we're consuming enormous research, resources to build this. Whereas if, quote, they have their imprimatur on a system. One of the marks is what's absent from the system. And what's absent from the system is the technology that I know has been out there and viable as a commercial product since late 2011, depending on whose patents you look at, to give us free renewable energy that would then let us run this type of system without the consequences of the carbon overhead. Well, when we talk about the responsibility, right, we keep coming back to the responsibility, the responsibility of knowledge, of knowing what you need to know to be able to make responsible decisions. So in knowing that, so for example, the whole thing, that one aspect of blockchain, Bitcoin, the power usage, I guarantee that the vast majority of people you ask who do know blockchain, who, who do know Bitcoin, who at least have a basic understanding of it, if you ask them, about that aspect, I bet you they know nothing about it. So here's a piece. It's a piece of this that is an unknown. Like, it wasn't until I saw the Quinn Michaels videos that I actually said, holy shit, I never even, that, I never thought of it that way. So we're talking massive amounts of usages of energy. With all these governments going towards cryptocurrencies, with all these governments, you know, like Saudi Arabia and their freaking ginormous computer banks. And, you know, China's doing the same thing. We know Russia's doing the same thing. 
is there going to be a push? Because you, here you go, you've got, you got the, there's fucking Paris Accords. We're going to lower our CO2 levels and it's going to cost us $67 billion to do that, but we'll do that. Um, is there a push somewhere in there that is going to be an opening for that alternative energy systems? Well, is, I is, think there a, is there a point when we're going to see that explode where all of a sudden we're going to say, yeah, listen, you guys and your fucking CO2 and your fucking carbon footprints, what about this fucking system you're running over here that sucks up this many gigawatts a minute while you mine cryptocurrency or whatever it is that you're doing? The, the other part of this, and I think I brought this up in the conversation with Cliff, is we know that a lot of the same people that are hiding free energy technologies from us are probably the same people that, that ha have these gangs of computers. So my question is, is are they actually Boom. part of the are they part of the reason that they're yeah. secreting these the technologies away from us is because they're using them right now to gain the advantage in what they know is going to be the new financial system. So well, who has the greatest amount of computing power and who, by the way, has the greatest incentive to run black budget bot projects through a back end that's fully encrypted end to end? <laughs> well, you might want to look at the national supercomputing project. You might want to look at DARPA. You might want to look at the military, which is the largest buyer of computing platforms on the planet. And you might want to ask yourself if maybe, just maybe they're not a little invested in this somewhere ancillary, maybe not on the front end, but at the back end is yeah, an engineering yeah. structure. I mean, I'm willing to be uber paranoid on this for the safe, safety and sake of saying we need to look at this again. Uh huh. Agreed. I was paranoid too. That's why that mining pool pie chart shows you where the big mining pools are. And if you delve into that, can you pull that in, up? They're in China. I'm trying to see if I can find it. Give me a second. It'd be nice which, if we get a screenshot of that. For that. Uh, I haven't seen that. Which uses what's what's dams, hy hydro. Hydropower? Yeah. Hydroelectric. 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 Yeah. yeah. Um, which uh, I've seen articles that it's so infantile as far as the cost uh, per megawatt on that. And that's what's running those big mining rigs over there, as well as geothermal in New Zealand. So I've seen little articles by some researchers that kind of tie where the energy is coming from. So that's when Quinn came out and said, well, there's all this energy going into the mining. I, on surface level, could not prove that. So if there's a super researcher that has time that can really look at the mining pool, tie it to the company, tie it to the electric bills, you would start to know if they're using free energy. That's well, just this, a question. This would, I would love to, you know, I would love to get, this is where, Catherine Austin Fitz really comes into this conversation. I can't because find Ka it, Jeff. So if you even Hydro is technically... Me, I can't find it on my computer. I have no idea what I've done with it. I even Hydro is technically not free energy. Yeah. First off, it doesn't meet the qualifications in terms of return on energy compounded. Secondly, it has an infrastructure overhead of itself. Yeah. Having said that, there are calculations. Um, take the source for what it's worth, but the numbers were researched and the Motherboard Magazine article, Bitcoin transactions now use as much energy as your house in a week, which estimated Bitcoin transactions are per running 300,000 transactions a day. And they are utilizing, um, looking for the number here, Bitcoin, um, put in a 77 kilowatt hours of energy per Bitcoin transaction. That's pretty wow. steep. So yes. now that's an aggregate number. I don't know that those numbers are precise or how anybody could even claim to have that amount of precision. Yeah. But they're ballpark, ballpark numbers that give you a sense that this is, we know it's energy intensive. It doesn't matter how they're pumping the, 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 the terawatts out. The fact of the matter is it's an energy consumptive process of doing this. Yeah. Let me just back up to what I was saying before. I think this is where, and, and, you know, maybe if she'll talk to us, Randy, maybe we, where we need to go next in this conversation is with Catherine Austin Fitz, because I think she'd be, you know, with her level of knowledge about black budget, 
quote unquote secret space program, although we might have different ideas of what exactly it is. She is very well aware. She spoke at the Breakthrough Energy Conference. She mm -hmm. is very well aware of the free energy technologies. She's very well aware of black budget and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm glad to hear what Jeff was saying that she's starting to enter into this conversation. Well, and when, by the way, when she spoke, in. when she spoke at the energy conference in Boulder in 2013, her talk was on crowdfunding, which is interesting. So, I mean, you know, the models, I, I'm not looking at the models so much as I'm, I'm looking at the aggregate of everything that's going into this and, whether this is the best road to go, given the timeline we're on right now. I mean, yeah. we're, we're not, well, the, the, the clock is, no matter what we do, they can't sustain a dollar-based system any longer. I mean, it's already collapsed, and it's collapsed, and it's collapsed in on itself, and it's now infra-collapsed, and it's going to continue to collapse. The only reason it doesn't fail is because the full faith of the American people has kept the dollar moving enough to sustain it. It's all gas and all hot air at this point. Yeah. Um, I've got that ch pie chart, so just give me a second. I'm going to pull that up. Okay, can you guys see that now? Yes. Yes. Okay, so, hold on, I'm going to do this. Uh, just to make it a little bit more clear to see. Um, so, <laughs> you look at these pools, so the big one, BTC comp dot com right has got 16 percent so that's obviously the largest percentage ant pool btc top via btc the problem is who are these people uh let's see one two three are china that i know straight off hand ant pool via and uh f2 oh no f2 is uh, south korea I think. Okay, um, so but again, we talk about, if, we, if we're going to go back to what I was talking about with consensus, are, are we looking at, a, you know, like basically if, if Ant Pool is China and it's got 14.8% and maybe, uh, what was the other one you said? Via? Mm -hmm. BTC, is that China? So there you go. Now all of a sudden they've got 27, 28 and a bit percent. So if they start connecting up, are we looking at you? So you've got Bitcoin India in there is quite small, but you've got all these other ones. Are we looking at a struggle to take over a supremacy? We are, and that's why China, you know, closed down the exchanges and miners. Mm -hmm. I don't know that uh, these companies are actually mining in China at this moment because they kind of move their mining rigs. I mean, it, this is minutia detail. But even John McAfee just sparked up a massive mining rig up by Hanford up in Washington State to help the U.S. be part of this. And... We hear Venezuela and Brazil. They're all starting to spark up rigs. Okay. okay, so I have to call this one. If you say to spark up, he's doing this in the, you know, to, to help the U.S. be part of this. I don't know if I'm, the, I, I'm sorry. I believe firmly 100% that the U.S. is controlling the China. vast majority. So... If it maybe it's like it's the NSA or the CIA or you know name your black ops secretive groups, we've seen the big giant buildings with the whole, you know, ridiculous. We've seen the story play out as well, where they've got secret buildings that run all these computer networks, etc. So when I see something on the surface like that, saying, "Oh, they were going to help the U.S. get into this," I really have to laugh and go, "Bullshit." Like the U.S. has to be the controlling factor, or at least was, past tense, the controlling factor. Yeah, I can't disagree. Well, essentially, we ceded our technology into China since 1972, when Nixon did the initial negotiations with the then communist government. Uh -huh. We've been on that course for a long time. There's some people that have argued with me about the fact that the Chinese are so advanced. They're ahead of us in terms of 
technology, storage, um, all of the components to data? And the answer to that is they are on the surface, but the patents and the intellectual property were held and still are held by companies within the US proper using foreign corporations to avoid all of the obvious penalties that come as a result of being a US corporation. Mm -hmm. So you don't really know on the surface. The Chinese are not, in my mind, the enemy either way. There still appears to be, pardon the pun, kind of a cryptocracy running this whole thing in terms of accountability. If you, they talk about it being anonymous and yet it being fully open. Like that's, that's the whole back and forth that you get when you look at the whole Bitcoin arguments. It's like, it's totally anonymous from, from the talking hats over here. And the other guy's like, no, it's, not, it's totally open. You can, everyone can see what's going on, etc. But the thing is, is that we don't know who's behind the face that's done this thing. Like if you've got a company here that's got the largest pie bet, who controls that company? Who makes the decisions of how they work and what they do? And you're right, it's a cryptocracy. And is that the moment going forward? We trade one tocracy for another tocracy. Yep, but as Steve uh, Cliff pointed out, I mean, we're still at 3% of the world really opting in. So we're in this condensed little growth zone that when it spurts, it, everything gets distributed. So there's, uh, it's a tough, it's not static. What it's we, not that static. Graph is not no, static. and it's not linear either. No. Right. It, it's not static. It ain't linear. It has a little bit of loopishness to it, though. Let me tell you, you watch the loops play through and you go, ah, oh, really? Um, this has been a fantastic conversation and, and it's literally just opened the doors to so many more things because we really even didn't get into heavily into the AI aspect of this because that does, this is another major piece. Well, like we say, it may not mean that blockchain and Bitcoin were created by AI, but that AI question still exists and needs to be you know, taken out and have a bright light shone on it and some discussion over it. Um, there's so many aspects to this and it brings me to the thing of like with the financial, not just the financial, but the financial and we're looking at dates, things that, like I said, in the, the, the recording I did on Wednesday, like when you start tying together dates, certain dates just always seem to touch and certain things have all happened at certain times in seemingly different areas. I don't believe in coincidence. There's a lot more to this conversation. And I mean, this gets into the deep shit. I'm like we, we talk about things, you know, the, the whole construct, the simulation conversation. Mm -hmm. What does all of this conversation have to do? How, what role does that play if we're looking at a greater simulation conversation? And you know, the what the fuck effect, the Toto effect, the Mandela effect, however you want to call it. The shit that we have seen, seen with our own eyes, experienced ourselves, playing out. There's a lot more questions to this. A lot more. Um, so, anyone, if you guys want to throw in, we, we've got just a couple minutes left. Well, we can go over if we want, but we've got a couple minutes left. Do you guys want to throw in any closing comments on this? Or open up another big can of fucking worms that needs to be looked at. Emily, you're muted. I have to go in just a minute, but I just want to say them thanks for having me. And this has been a really interesting conversation and hopefully we'll all reconvene and continue this conversation. Yeah. Um, Jeff, I also love to chat with you sometimes. So let's make that happen. Yep. And, um, yeah. Let's get Jeff on. I, I think that yeah. would be a great conversation to have focused. I yeah, appreciate let's, it. Yes. That would let's, be do awesome. all, let's do this all again. Danny, I think yeah. you have great points. Randy, you know, I think you're a genius all the time. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. I don't even know. What I live to in say. the shadow of Randy's genius, but I'm okay with that. Not really. <laughs> um, it's okay. I think Randy's a genius too. It's why I keep dragging him on the show. 
Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so thank you for having me, and uh, thanks for everyone who came in and listened and participated. And um, I have to step out, but I love you all. Yep, I am. Um, pleasure. All right. Yeah. Well, we will definitely reconvene this 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 again because we like I said we. It, it feels like the beginning of a conversation. It doesn't feel like an end of a conversation, even remotely. And uh, may, maybe we'll give everyone a little bit of time to, 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 to chew on this a bit and uh, see if we can arrange it to uh, come back for a part two and really dig down some more dirty, dark, dusty rabbit holes. <laughs> well, and maybe some good stuff too. Well, maybe yeah. we get to the light. Well, you know, that's, that's the goal. That's the goal, right? I mean, the yeah. goal is always the understanding. If we can comprehend some of the stuff that's going on, it gives us a fuller comprehension of what we are doing, where we are going, and where the light is at the end of the time. Yep. Agreed. Well, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank Emily and Randy from Off Planet TV and Radio. Fucking love you guys. And Jeff, I'm so glad you could be here again yeah. today. This was yep. a fantastic call. Good to be able to hang with you, man. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Right back at you. <laughs> and uh, everyone else, you want to hang around, go right ahead. You know, there'll be the after show chat because there always is. Um, but we will see you again. Um, next Sunday, we're doing a special report. It's going to be Ann Callahan and I. This is not finalized yet, but Ann Callahan and I will be doing the quintessentially whole. And we are going to be talking cannabis. We're going to be talking about the endocannabinoid system. And we're going to be really digging deep into all the missing pieces on this one. Because holy <laughs> shit, the more I look into this, the more you realize, oh, there's so much we don't know about. So that's it. I will talk to you guys all on Sunday next week. Bye, everyone. Oh, my God.